Yeah, it's, it's all those things, buildings I was talking about in that section, those, those are really specific concepts that are part of the ego's self-concept. And that's part of the fragmented world. And you might say that that the real world is more like a unified mind. So, so it's more as if, like if you, if you relinquished those boxes or those concepts in the mind, and could look upon the world in a whole different way than the way that saw streets and buildings and cars and clouds and so on, and people and so on and so forth, if, if you could empty the mind of all of those concepts and we'll say, let it be given back to you, like in a purified form or, or cleansed of those specific concepts, then that would be the real world. And there's a line where Jesus says, it's beautiful, Jesus says, the body's eyes will continue to report differences, but the healed mind has put them into one category, one category. They are unreal. Or we could say better, the Holy Spirit shows you that there is only one category, then the body's eyes will continue to report differences. In other words, people would say, well, if Jesus was in the real world, wow, what did he see? It still seemed to be bodies and human bodies, men, women, you know, there seemed to be Nazarites, there seemed to be, you know, Gentiles and Jews, there seemed to be the disciples or the apostles they were called, and so on and so forth. And animals, donkeys, he wrote in, you know, the very end, Hosanna, Hosanna. He wrote in, you know, back into the city on a donkey, uh, you know. The body's eyes will continue to report differences. So Jesus goes through his life as Jesus, and then he, he comes magnificently in his mind into the real world. The body's eyes continue to report the differences of the world. But because he has allowed the Holy Spirit to put them into one category, they are all the same. So he he must be looking at the world in a different way than a human perspective. What kind of human being would be on a cross and and have nails and, or spikes, you know, in the arms and legs with blood dripping out and say, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Does that sound like a human uh, perspective? No, he was, he was teaching forgiveness from the cross. He was still teaching and demonstrating a state of mind, of peace, even when the body was nailed on a cross. That body nailed on the cross didn't, didn't detract from the, the lesson, which was, in fact, Jesus actually says that in the Course. He says, the real meaning of the crucifixion was this, teach only love, or that is what you are. Where is the sacrifice in that? Where is the suffering in that? He had transcended the guilt in his mind. He had transcended the, the belief that the images had meaning. He was invulnerable because he knew who he was. And he was identified with the mind and not the body. He wasn't literally in the body. You know, there were groups that came, the Gnostics came uh, af shortly after Jesus, and Gnosticism is really a beautiful teaching, because it's, believe it or not, right after Jesus, the Gnostics taught that the world wasn't real. That's pretty sharp. It's pretty on the money. Of course, they had to then experience that. <laughs> you can't just say it. You've got to actually get into the presence of that. But. But the early Gnostics, they actually had a little scenario where they had Jesus, while the body was hanging on the cross, they actually 
had like an image of Jesus off, off in the hills laughing at the whole scene. Uh, that's a pretty, you know, we talk about the laughing Jesus, that's, that's pretty high. They pictured Jesus off the cross, kind of laughing at the whole scene of being on the cross. Which was a symbol, again, of the real world. Of not taking the symbols and the images of this world seriously. As if they're real. So, that's also a state of mind of unification. There was no betrayer. Jesus, you know, did not see Judas as betraying him. He, he constantly, and if you go back and read the Gospels, he, he knew exactly what was coming in the script. And he told the apostles and he, he told others. He talked about tearing the temple down and rebuilding the temple in three days. He wasn't talking about an, an, a building. <coughs> He's talking about the body. The body will be torn down, crucified, and, and rebuilt in three days. It was literally, during the resurrection, the body of Jesus was used as, as appearances, as part of a symbol of teaching, you can't kill me. You tried, but <laughs> it didn't work. You know, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am eternal life. It was a skit. Even the resurrection, the appearances of Jesus, but that was just a symbol. You can't kill that which is eternal. And so, that's really what the real world is. It's, 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 it's really not seeing the world in the way that it was seen before, because the categories in the mind have, have vanished. And the world you perceive comes from the world that you believe. If you believe in fragmentation, you perceive fragmentation. If you believe in unity and wholeness, you perceive the real world. Or true perception, he calls it. Or the happy dream, he calls it. He uses a lot of different words to teach about the very same state of mind. He just uses different words in there. But that's what gives you the uh, the incentive to to judge not, you know, to release the categories from the mind. Yeah, well, well he's in that passage, the body's eyes will report differences. It, that's how the world seemed to arise, was it, it is, it is all false perception. And he already says in, in the workbook that, he does have a great line, he says, the body's eyes were made not to see, and the body's ears were made not to hear. So, True seeing, we could say, with the Holy Spirit is is an inner, is an inner seeing. Yeah. It's not vision as we would define it through eyes and and light waves and retina and you know all the aspects, the pupil and all those things. I one time I was in Cincinnati and uh, I. My friend Lisa and Jason and, and some friends of ours, we all went out on a walk and we were guided to walk across this big river, the Ohio River, and go to Kentucky. And we saw all these signs and symbols about sight and vision and so on and so forth. And, and we met someone who had, had blind, who was blind on the walk and we, we met different people. And when we got over to this festival that was going on in Kentucky, on the other side, we were going around and Lisa had a fake, she, it was, a, it was a, uh, a microphone like this, but we didn't have any real equipment with us. So she stuck the, the little plug thing into her, into her belt, and she went around just holding this cord and microphone and interviewing people about miracles, just asking people, do you believe in miracles? And that, that's, she, we went all over there and she kept in her glee and joy asking people of miracles. And one lady came up to us and she said, yes, I believe in miracles because we had signs and symbols that the whole walk was going to be about sight and vision and, and that was going to be the theme. And sure enough, everyone we met had something to do with sight or seeing. And we met this woman over there in Kentucky who said, I'll tell you my miracle, and as Lisa put the microphone, and she said, 
The scientists and the doctors say that I am a walking wonder. She said, I have no pupils. And we both, we all went, really? And we actually went up and we all looked into her eyes and she had no pupils. And she said, I've gone into clinics and I had my eyes tested and everything and, and the doctors say, no way, you can't possibly be seeing because you don't have pupils. You can't see without pupils. You know, it was, it was another one of those contradictory kind of things where, I mean, people don't, when people do, doctors and scientists do research on eyes, they're researching all kinds of things about the eyes, but they're not researching whether or not there are pupils there. It's just like pupils, eyes have, eyeballs have pupils. And she showed us her eyes, we all were like, Wow. As she'd go like this and gaze at one of us. She obviously, from the world's perspective, was seeing. She was, because she could look and she could talk about the colors she saw and she could talk about what we were all seeing around us. So it wasn't like she was blind at all. And she said, that's my miracle story, is we're going around and everyone we met, and including at the end, uh, something some, a child who had lost something who was blind, and the parents working with them. The Holy Spirit basically, after the whole day, was just saying, I remember now, the body's eyes were made not to see, and the body's ears were made not to hear. So don't think you'll ever experience meaning through the five senses. The meaning is in your mind. The meaning comes when you let go of the judgments and the categories and you see with the Holy Spirit, when you see with the vision of Christ, then you reach meaning. You know, like when people say, when you're having a talk with somebody and you're talking, talking, talking to them and they go, I see, I see. They're saying, I understand, I understand. They're actually using seeing as a synonym with understanding. And we could say that peace of mind is that seeing, is that understanding. That until you experience a consistent peace, it would be an honest statement to say that I do not see clearly. I, I, or I do not understand. There's nothing embarrassing about that. In fact, I think you'll find more and more as you go through your life, you'll get more and more comfortable laughing, more and more relaxed, and more and more comfortable saying, I don't understand, with a smile on your face, <laughs> as, as an opinion is coming your way, as, as a judgment is coming your way, you can go, I don't understand.